Thank you for joining us today. We've, we've really been excited about the launch of this film and being able to share it with you and the world. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the screening. And I'm honored that you all are here to celebrate this premiere of Second Shot with you. My name is Judge Victoria Pratt. I am the former chief judge of the Newark Municipal Court. I am a global criminal justice reformer. I'm also the author of The Power of Dignity, How Transforming Justice Can Heal Our Communities. But most importantly, today I am here as the new executive director for Odyssey Impact and Transform Films. Now, some of you are saying, what is Odyssey Impact and what is Transform Films? Well, Transform Films, is an, a Peabody award-winning production company that helped produce, that actually produced Second Shot. And Odyssey Impact is the nonprofit organization that is leading both the national social impact campaign for this film. And you'll hear a little bit about that at the end as we try to activate everyone into action. I've really had the fortune to be involved in the development of this um, social impact campaign, which is just really incredible. Today's conversation, as I prepare you for them, will weave in and out of um, the lifetime incarceration of minors, perspective of those who are harmed by wrongdoing and their families, redemption, the parole process, as well as restorative justice. So you will hear from our panelists. You will participate uh, through our chat in that conversation as well. I want you to note that Odyssey Impact is absolutely committed to accessibility. So you should see a live transcript button below that allows for closed captioning of this event. So if you need to access it, please do. And I also want to welcome, as we, um, as we are joined by our ASL interpreters, Selena Flowers and Benny Barber from Pro Bono ASL. Thank you for being with us and for being uh, part of this really incredible event today. Odyssey Impact is proud to present and bring you programming like today in collaboration with our partners and our network. And we couldn't do it without your support. So thank you for being uh, supporters of this work and for sharing it as well with the wor world. And we would continue, as, as we do this, it's really significant that we are able to continue to drive social change through innovative storytelling and media. And now, without further ado, we are pleased to premiere the 27-minute documentary film, Second Shot. I thought I was a good kid. I was going to be someone my parents was going to be proud of. It all took a step in the wrong direction when I was shot. I was shot four times in a drive-by shooting. One of my friends suggested to me, why don't you carry a gun? You need this. And then this gun became my security. What? I didn't think that someone was going to call my bluff one day and actually fire at me that night in a movie theater. Before we get started, I, I want to kind of lay a little bit of framework around restorative justice, which will be one of the themes that we talk about but I wanted to talk about it with you all because there's some people who are not familiar with it. And when wrongdoing, when an offense happens in the community, it is seen as a tear in the fabric of the community, a tear in relationships and in feelings. We as the community, as the people who have been harmed, those, the family members of those who've been harmed, uh, the family members of those who did the wrongdoing. It, we are all the fabric. We are all the threads that are interwoven. And so the offense is seen as a tear in the relationships in this community. 
And what restorative justice seeks to do is repair the harm and rebuild relationships within the community. So what we've done today is we've assembled the community to participate in this conversation. And um, I have the honor of, of introducing them. So I'm gonna take an a moment to introduce our panelists to join the discussion, um, to say a quick hello, and so that we can really get into the meat of the discussion. My panelists know it's all from my heart, but if y'all go too long, I'm gonna interrupt you, so move on to the next question. But um, I, I do want, I really do want an opportunity for people to really talk about and, and dig into these questions. So, and, and they'll provide you with a very short, very short little bit of their background. Um, if I'd like to introduce you to Andrew Michael, and Ellis, who's the director of this incredible film, Second Shot. Thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm Andrew. Thank you so much. Um, shall I, uh, Judge Pratt, should I give a little, uh, should I say a few words or just say? You can say a few words about, you know, if you have a company, tell, tell us who you are. Yeah, my name's Andrew. I'm a, I'm a film director. I formerly did live in New York and now I'm in Los Angeles. And um this film was um, a labor of of love and and a personal moral inquiry that I uh, you know conducted over about a four year period, um, and the project really evolved from kind of a simple profile piece on Lawrence to then like really an examination of of the moral complexity of of. The justice system and 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 the injustice of how uh, how it reckons with violent crime. So um, yeah, it's on, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Andrew. You were about to give away too much. <laughs> um, I'm going to come back to Chad, who's actually in motion. He Chad Hall, who is featured in the film, he is driving. So we will get back to him as soon as he um, is able to jump on the line. Uh, I would like to introduce you to Lawrence Brantley, who is also, I'm um, Bartley, I'm sorry that I called you Brantley, uh, who's also featured in the film. Can you give us a greeting? Mr. Hi, Brantley? my name is Lawrence Bartley, um, publisher of the Marshall Project Inside. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine Jones, who is the co-director of Outreach and Partnership Development at Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, thank you for having me. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, yes. Um, I was going to give my title. <laughs> um, I'm <laughs> Catherine, the co-director of the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. Um, I was incarcerated in 13, came home when I was 30, and it sparked a passion for me to fight to end juvenile life without parole and other extreme sentences for children. Excellent, excellent, excellent. And the Reverend Dr. John H. Vaughn, who's the executive pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. Good afternoon. It's good to be here. Um, in addition to being the executive pastor here at Ebenezer, we are the co-founders in the home for the multi-faith initiative to end mass incarceration. And particularly this topic of restorative justice certainly is close to our heart as a communities of faith. So it's really good to be here. So as Lawrence and Chad have been so generous and so gracious to surrender their feelings to us to share their stories. Um, I want us to remember and to know that it is actually a gift. It's a gift that they have given us. And as with all gifts, we want to show gratitude and be appreciative. But it also leads me into my introduction of the Reverend Dr. Barbara Wilson, Chief Resilience Officer and owner of Wilson Coaching LLC, who will now walk us through some audience guidelines for today's conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Judge Pratt. Hello, everyone. I would really encourage us uh, right where we are to take a deep breath, uh, to breathe in deeply as you desire and to exhale. Um, we come today, and I've put my land acknowledgement in the chat as well, we acknowledge and affirm that courage and so much more has brought all of us into this space today. 
and we acknowledge and affirm the dignity, value, and worth of us all. We also recognize that as we co-create this conversation together today, that emotions and thoughts are, may be triggered, that indeed this very experience is and could be traumatic for many of us. So as a result, as Judge Pratt just talked about restorative justice, we are engaging in this conversation together with a restorative practices lens in mind. And what do we mean by that? First, we encourage each of us to be present to ourselves. You each, we each know what we need as we are in this experience today. So breathe, inhale and exhale deeply. Take a break from the video as you are sensing in, in your bodies and in your thoughts and, and, and your uh, emotions uh, come up. We invite you to move and to stretch and to stand as you are able. The next thing we invite all of us to do is to commit to using respectful communication guidelines uh, by Eric Law, both verbally and in the chat. And this is to take responsibility for whatever you say and what you feel without blaming others. To use empathetic listening, we really invite all of us to do some deep listening today, just as we've done as we've viewed this wonderful film to be sensitive to differences in communication styles, and then to ponder, really think about what we hear and feel before we speak or before we write our comments and our thoughts in the chat. This experience invites us through a restorative lens to examine our own assumptions and perceptions first, and then to keep confidentiality. Now, although this panel discussion is being recorded and strict confidentiality is not applicable, I am suggesting that as we share our experiences of this event going forward, that we maintain the integrity of the stories that we hear, of the comments and the dialogue that we hear today. And then finally, trust the ambiguity. As you know, we're not here to debate who's right or wrong. All of our questions will not be answered today, nor all of our concerns addressed. And with that, we ask that we all commit to doing so. So let's enter in more deeply. Thank you, Judge Pratt. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. I feel blessed. I feel blessed with that. I, I just want to also let the participants know, the audience, that Odyssey Impact has dropped the bios of the individuals on this call who are on this panel in the chat. So please take a second to look at them. You might have some questions as it relates to some of their background, as it results, um, as it relates to today's film. So I'm going to start with you, Andrew, who um, must be really proud. Um, congratulations. Can you start to share what really compelled you to tell this story? I mean, there are so many stories to tell, but what compelled you to tell this story? And, and what was challenging as a filmmaker about telling this particular story? We'll do that. I think we were just joined by Chad. I want to say, hey, Chad. Hello, Chad. I want to thank you for um, interrupting yourself so I didn't have to do it. I want to welcome Chad Hall, who is featured in the film. If you could just give us a quick greeting, Chad. and um. Thank you again for uh, being participating in this film and surrendering your feelings and sharing yourself and your story. Could you uh, just introduce yourself to everyone on the call? Oh, hello everyone, I'm Chad Hall. I am the uh, sibling of the deceased. Okay, all right, so thank you. So I'm I, gonna go, I'm so sorry. I apologize for uh, being late. I, I made up a good excuse for you, so don't even worry. <laughs> if you could finish, Andrew. <laughs> um, you said the challenges. Yeah, the the well, this you know this film. Um, I was actually initially um, commissioned by a the the very uh, organization that Lawrence now works for, the Marshall Project. Before he worked for them, they uh, they wanted me to come and, and film the day that Lawrence was released from Sing Sing. And so this issue has been a, a of criminal justice reform has been on my heart and in my uh, mind and, and in my family for, for years. And so, you know, I, I just 
it wasn't, it was in the realm of possibility that someone would ask me to go do that type of thing. And, uh, and so I showed up, it's a beautiful day to film, you know, to start filming because, you know, the emotions are flying. It's, it's, it's cinematic. You, you know, there's a big moment. Um, so it's just exhilarating to get to do that. Um, but I didn't really know just how much I would, uh, appreciate Lawrence as a person. Um, and so very quickly started making what I thought would be a little film about um, how the parole process went for Lawrence. Um, and I had a little 10 minute film that was trying to expose the injustice that, that, you know, he was retried for a case when he should have, you know, he wasn't being judged on the person that he was at after serving 28 years. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I had a little film that was ready to go uh, and ready to ship out and we had a release plan for it. And I just started to think, you know, there's a whole other side that this film hasn't really inquired about. And, and that was, you know, what, what got this all started and, and who was impacted by, by the crime that was committed. And so, started a whole separate dialogue and chapter of the filmmaking process and um, by conversations with Chad and um, and began to see that there were two very sympathetic and and understandable sides to this story that um, mm -hmm. and started to believe that there were there was a system that was pitting them against each other essentially um, and that's that that to tell that story to kind of bring the two voices into harmony was a challenge technically and um and almost like making a film about something that doesn't exist which is you know some form of uh a restorative justice type thing that just doesn't that the system are are kind of um medieval style of eye for an eye justice is is not set up you know there's only you, you open the tool bag and it's just a hammer laying in there and so um, so yeah, it was a challenge to make a film about something that doesn't exist yet in our, in our, mm -hmm. as, as our go-to system for how we reckon and reconcile with violence. So, um, so well, I think you. that was, that was the challenge. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. That I, I love, um, when you said bringing the voices into harmony, that, that's a, that was just very powerful to me about this idea of bringing two voices that are in separate, in separate spaces into one. Chad, so welcome again. I'm going to ask you about, at, at the beginning, you, you decided to share your family's story in the film, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about that. And as you answer that, I also want you to answer and, and think about, did your initial thinking about why you did that change, or if anything changed as you experienced making this film? Um... So as far as how it affected my family, it it uh it affected my family greatly. Um, as I as I stated in the film, my brother was like the son, and everybody else within my family, we rotated around him. Um, he pretty much was the was the focal point in my household because he was the youngest. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> you know when we when when he was lost, it, it it greatly affected everybody else's coexistence. Um, as I stated before, you know, the death of a child can either make or break a family, and I lived that, you know. My mom and my dad, my mom went and grieved in her way, my dad went that way and grieved in his way, and I went and grieved in my way. So it was, it was a really hard, situation to deal with um as far as the documentary i was uh i was fine with with making a documentary um <clears throat> i believe that the way you impact lives is to talk about your experience mm. um as i learned when i was a high school dean it's it's not about how many people you, it's not about how many kids you interact with. It's about the kids that you reach on a personal level. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that, you know, my story would 
perhaps give some value. And like I like I expressed to you before, I always wanted to uh, make sure that my brother had a voice. Because mm-hmm. I know if uh, if I were the one who were deceased, he would make sure that I had a voice. Excellent. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and and that's what is key about the restorative process is that it doesn't hijack the process from those who are harmed. Whereas the regular criminal justice system, they make decisions based on, you know, is this person a good victim? How are they going to testify? So um, thank you for sharing that. Lawrence, why were you willing to tell your story? Why? Um, what what made it um, so urgent for you? What, why did you choose to share? Um, for many reasons. A um, few that I can name is that there are many people who are incarcerated um, during my time that I came across that I, I've gotten to know, I've gotten to represent folks. I used to be part of what's called the uh, inmate liaison committee. It was like sort of an incarcerated person's government. Mm-hmm. And I was tasked with like learning the needs of the incarcerated population and and, and articulating the, those to the prison administration and the prison administration would tell me their needs and I would share it back. And during the course of doing that, you're dealing with um, 1,500, 2,000 people and staff and incarcerated people with op- opposing views of who each other are. Um, and then reflecting on that throughout my time of my incarceration and what I did to get in there, um, it, it kind of it, it made me become very introspective about who I was as a person and, and what I did. And I, I knew that there are other people around me who weren't able to express themselves, whether they came from broken homes or they they had some type of mental disabilities or, or they were just traumatized in, in such a way that they no longer can express their humanity. And I figured if I can express what I was feeling and, and the level of remorse that I had for, you know, Chad and, and, and his family and, and what happened with Tremaine, I think, it, it put a different face on individuals who were incarcerated. Mm-hmm. It gave them a, a, a different kind of debt because there's many people who want to do what I did to reach out to their victims um, and their families to say, you know, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for what I did, but the state, there's no mechanism for them to do that except for writing letters. And they write letters goes into what's called an apology bank. And a person could be in prison for 20 years and had an apology letter sitting there for 20 years, but the family is never notified of it unless the family calls the state and say, hey, is there a letter for me? But there's no way for them to know this. Not that that letter would cure any ills, not that a letter would um, bring about a sense of closure, but at least to know it was there. You know, if I, mm-hmm. it, it was just, you know, it was just a way of offering whether I accept it or not to know it was there. But then there's the whole parole board aspect as a, a third party coming in. The, the crime that took place and way it affected two families is, is really personal for both of those families. And to have a, a third party, whether it's the state or whether it's the uh, uh, parole board, to intervene in such a personal way to, to cast judgment over both without really having to to 10 toes and 10 fingers on it and feeling it and being empathetic it's kind of a bit unfair you know so i wanted to do this film to kind of express all those aspects so people can look at it and make their judgments whichever way they will okay thank you thank you catherine you are next on my list i see a lot of head nodding and i'd um really like you to tell us like what resonated with you in the film that connects back to your own story and made you want to be involved with the impact campaign because you served as a part of our brain trust. And um, I, I don't know if people saw or heard, you, you, know, you were one of the youngest people in our history to be um, sentenced as an adult in this country, as a juvenile. So when um, they talked about juvenile lifers, um, I just wanted you to talk about what resonated with the films as it connects back to your own story. Um, as I always say, 
Judge Pratt, that's such a huge question because it resonated on so many levels. Um, but relating to um, Lawrence and knowing what it's like to make a, a decision when you're a child at 13 and um, particularly the decision to make to take the to someone's life and and I and the weight that that carries and there not being a mechanism set up for there to be any type of restoration or healing you know I lived in one of those states Lawrence talked about where I could not reach out to the family and then I when I came home at 30 um, just last year there was an incident for going to the court trying to get the probation terminated and hearing the pain in my victim's family's statements the hurt and the anger um we weren't on opposing sides anymore but to hear but to see the system dragging them out for their own agenda to, in order to stop us from getting the probation terminated um my heart broke for them and the understanding thinking for 20, almost 20 something years you hadn't even heard my name they had the, there had never been anything designed to bring healing to you and then the first time you hear my name is when I'm we're trying to get a probation termination mm -hmm. um to sympathize with that and also in my work because we work with both I can members like me who were children that had um taken someone's life and got sent to extreme sentence, but also having a national family network of family members of those incarcerated, as well as survivor network of those that have been impacted by youth violence. And so being in the, the, the realm to hear and listen to all sides and think about how can we truly make the system a true justice system where there's not opposing sides, but that the ultimate goal is to bring healing to both parties in whatever fashion that's needed for them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, ha is, is something that's very, very important to me because I know for me, it wasn't until I was in my 20s and 30s. Matter of fact, when I became a mother is when I understood the pain that I caused the family mm -hmm. of, of Nicole. And it, as it, I had to grow and mature and, and experience things to really understand the consequences of what I had done. And so that's why I do what I do now. It's my way of living a life of redemption Mm -hmm. and, to, and, and to bring as much healing into society as, as, as I did harm. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, you're talking about harm in this, you know, process, restorative justice is about repairing the harm and rebuilding relationships with the community and within the community, which will lead me to um, the Reverend, Reverend Vaughn, to talk about um, your, your experience. Actually, as a stakeholder representing the religious and the faith community, can you share what you believe the role of faith communities are in this situation, what they should be? Yes, I, and I first, I really want to thank uh, Chad and Lawrence for being here and um, being present and really honor your stories and experience. I think it's... Uh, I think it's really critical for us, I think, as faith communities to 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 both provide a space for mm -hmm. for these conversations as well as to walk alongside and to be with families. And some of us have done it better than others. You know, I mean, you know, let's you know, we'll be certainly real about that and and to do it in ways that is all about from at least for me. Um, out of a Christian tradition, you know, Jesus is present with people, you know, and walking with people. And I really, I like the, the notion earlier when, when the description of, well, there's only really one option here versus, you know, being able to explore, are there other ways to, um, to address punishment and restitution and, and beginning to lean into some of those different models. And so I think we're excited to see the, seeing the expansion of restorative justice practices, you know, being engaged um, and then coming up with, you know, together, you know, what are, what is the, what are the, what are the ways to build, you know, and to be in the reparative process. So, you know, and I think as folks have said, I mean, these are not easy. And mm -hmm. I think part of what, Part of, I think, what we as faith communities can do is to embrace the complexity and the challenges and the multiple feelings and, you know, versus making judgment about either of those, uh, you know, uh, but to but to be present 
with people and really pray, you know, and I think for us, it's the presence of the spirit, the presence of that which is greater than us that can somehow inhabit these, these situations and, and help guide us. Thank you. Um, I'd like to jump to the parole process because it's one of the more powerful things I think this film does because no one, the whole parole process is always so opaque. You know, um, and so to be able to hear from people who've gone, and I want to jump to you, Chad, if you could share a little bit about your experience with the parole process as representing the family and people who had been harmed, what the parole process was like for you as someone who was brought before. I mean, you go into detail in the film to talk about being in this space with a stenographer and things like that, but um, your thoughts on the, the process um so you probably won't like my answer but my answer so there there's two answers to that um as being the sibling of someone who was killed what you have to understand is so we're yes we're talking about restorative justice and i get everybody deserves Mm -hmm. a second chance, hence the title of the film, Second Chance. But um, the, the process of parole, right, to me, so Lawrence's sentence was 27 and a third to life. He did 28, right? Um, everybody, as far as I was concerned, this is how I, this is how I looked at it. Mm -hmm. Um. Lawrence was allowed to go to school. He got an education. He was allowed to get married. He was allowed to have kids. Um, all things that my brother will never get to do. Um, as far as the parole process, I, I, I assumed that people go to jail to be punished. So when it came time for his, you know, when his early parole release, when his parole releases came up, yeah, I thought on one hand, yeah, he served his time. He should have a chance. But I also felt like it was like, okay, I've done my time. I've also now established a wife, two kids, and I just want to hurry up and get to that. But forget about that. There's still a family that's been left in disarray and still hasn't completely recovered from the loss. And so for the, for the parole process for me, wasn't about me per se. It was more or less to give my brother a voice because he couldn't be there to talk for himself. That, 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 that's what that process was really like for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, granted, you know, I felt like, yeah, he did his time, but the objective, everybody's talking about, you know, restorative justice and feelings and this and that. You committed a crime. You go to jail to be punished. Mm -hmm. All the other things that we're talking about come after you get out. But I think a lot of it is like, I've been this great person. I want to get out. You still have a family who has not been made whole mm -hmm. in a sense. Their lives are still hanging in the balance. So, you know, like I said, for me, it was just about giving my brother a voice mm -hmm. because he wasn't able to be there and speak for himself. So do you feel like parole, and I, and, and I promise you, Chad, you are here to talk. I don't need to like your answers. I, I want you to have them. We want to just be sure that you have them. Did you feel that the parole process heard you? Do you feel that the parole process Oh, well, so because it's a part of our justice system. The parole process is not a part of a restorative process. So um, did you feel that you got what you thought you were supposed to get from the parole process in terms um, of- Oh, absolutely, I did. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until the state changed the age limit to where that now put everything in a different perspective, you mm -hmm. know? Um, Honestly, I know when uh, his early release parole came up and I let my parents know, 
And I was a little, I was a little perturbed at my mother's response because between my dad and I, I believe she suffered the most. Mm -hmm. She carried my brother and, you know, she was, yeah, my father was, my father was the head of household in a figurative speech, but all the women in my family have been the matriarch, have been in charge, you know, uh, what do they say? The woman, the woman, the, the woman is the one who controls the man's head. So my mom was that individual. She <laughs> said, at Lauren, by the time Lawrence got his early parole, um, his early release for parole, my mother was like, um, you know, really? She was like, I feel like he's done his time. You know, we should let that go. And I looked at her like, are you kidding me? I was like, if Tremaine was here, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be, you know, silent. This is, a, this is an opportunity, you know, for everybody to say their piece, say how they feel, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so again, like I said, for me, it was about making sure that my 15 year old brother had a voice yeah. and that's all I was concerned about. Now, Lawrence, you had already spoken about your process, your experience with parole. I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to add, because I do want to kind of touch on some other subjects as well. Yeah, sure. Um, but but I, I definitely want to say that, you know, Chad sh should feel the way he felt. It, mm -hmm. it, I mean, a, a life was taken and, and there's no... There's, no amount of time can can give that life back. So I understand, you know, his perspective, and and I'm sure others understand it and, and, and can honor it as well. But I think it's important that I say that, and I and I wouldn't this out. It wouldn't be real if Chad was to come on here and, and, and say restorative justice, Lawrence needs a chance, this kind of stuff. If he didn't feel that way, mm -hmm. and and. Uh, and there's many families who have been um, shattered because of violent crime that, that don't get an opportunity to speak, that may feel that way. Um, and it's, it's a part of the restorative justice process and the, and the justice is for that family as well. Whether the um, system is not providing that justice, they, they, they might exist for, um, like, like Chad said, like they punishment but they're called correctional facilities. So mm -hmm. people, uh, our community is, is unaware of exactly how these systems are supposed to function because we see the dysfunction in so many ways. Then there's people at the opposite ends of it, like 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 Chad and, and myself, who, who, who is there feeling in the middle, mm -hmm. you know? So, but that's my, my point on that. But as far as the parole process, when I went, um, I felt that I, I felt that I had I had demonstrated who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I sat before the parole board, the first thing they did, they started um, retelling all the um, gruesome details of everything that happened, but embellishing it much. Um, and what was on that piece of paper was factual to them. Mm -hmm. And I kind of felt I, I felt embarrassed and a bit angered that you know it wasn't it wasn't there was really very little room for who I was and like they didn't know me at all and I was sitting before strangers who haven't gotten to know me for many years was it the warden who knew me for nine years wasn't the correction officers knew me for eight years wasn't the, the incarcerated person who knew me for 20 years could tell you stories on who I was when I was 20 22 25 30 40 um, so it, 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 that imbalance was there, but they they passed they were passing judgment and and I felt that the process could have been a little more more true to the mm -hmm. entire entire piece and if it and to be honest if it wasn't for that lawsuit I wouldn't have gotten out but that I could probably would have still been in there right now. You know, what's so beautiful about this whole panel and this discussion is that um, this is really serving as a model 
for communities that don't get the opportunity to have this conversation and just walk around um, almost bumping into each other's harm, into each other's pain. So I, again, I just keep thanking you guys because it's really important that um, this conversation can help to stop retaliation sometimes in our community that happens when something happens. So um, I want to move on to the question of the, the issue of lifetime incarceration of juveniles. And I'm going to jump to uh, Catherine um, to just talk a little bit about your thoughts. I mean, it's, it's your life experience. And you know, from your perspective, what work needs to be done around the issue of lifetime incarceration of minors? Yes, absolutely. And and there was a question in the chat, and it's something that I've asked in, in my situation many, many times. That if if a child um, takes someone's life, what like what are the reparations? What could possibly and children still have to be held accountable. You, you, but it needs to, in an age appropriate manner because just because you commit harm, you don't cease to be a child. Mm -hmm. If if I would if I was 13 and had not committed the crime I did, I would not in a pedophile came within 10 miles of me, they would be incarcerated immediately. <laughs> Yet the experience of what it's like to be placed in an adult prison as a child me was the it's it's not rehabilitation or restorative it's punitive it's and it's in the the things that children are exposed to when we're incarcerated but to back it up brain science says that's why the supreme court made the decisions to end death penalty for children and why so many states are are banning life sentences it's because the brains aren't fully developed in children they're more impulsive they're more emotional even now in this generation where Violence seems to be, you know, you see it in the video games and the Call of Duty and not recognizing like the true consequences of, 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 of harming other people, but that a unique capacity for change. And the fact that the Florence and myself and so many of our IQ members that you see that came home and became pillars of the community, that speaks to their resilience and their character because the system isn't designed to rehabilitate people when they go into mm -hmm. the prison. And people like myself who didn't receive life, but received an extreme sentence. And one day I'm going to come home. And one day I'm going to be your neighbor. One day you're going to pass me in the grocery store. It's imperative for everyone in the community to be invested that these kids are placed in an environment where they're able to heal and become better and, and, and to come home to be productive and have the skills and resources they need to do so. And to take it even more personal, mm -hmm. take a life at 13. And in my experience, being a victim of sexual abuse and made a 13-year-old decision to get myself out of it. Mm -hmm. And to go into that environment further traumatized. And it was only because of a pastor and his wife that came in and mentored me that I became who I was. But to be paced in that situation that was even worse, to further be traumatized, further sexually assaulted, mm -hmm. that wasn't justice. Nobody won from that. And so I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have an answer of what would be the correct thing, but the correct thing isn't to put kids in prison for the rest of their life and not give them the opportunity to come home. It's mm -hmm. an economic decision. It costs more to incarcerate than re rehabilit to mm -hmm. rehabilitate. I'm going to go to Lawrence and then also to Chad, because interestingly enough, Chad, you have dedicated most of your life to work transforming young men who would get in trouble and end up in prison and who are in facilities. So um, I'm going to go to you two to kind of talk about this experience. One, Lawrence, because this is, again, your life experience and the work that you were doing while you were in there. Well, well, yeah. Um, well, as, as Catherine alluded to, there's brain science that says that a child's brain doesn't fully develop until around 25 or 27. So the child's impetuous, makes impulsive decisions, it takes a lot of risk. And that's why you see a lot of crimes being committed between that people from that age group from around, you know, 16-ish to 24. Um, 
So that's the time where, where they need a lot of parental guidance when when children are, are, are being shaped from mm-hmm. up to their 27-ish. But when they're placed into prison for the rest of their lives, they when they fully cook, you know, their warehouse for the rest of their lives, they like Catherine mentioned, no one wins there. And in fact, I'll take it a step further. There are people who get incarcerated and they become traumatized by solitary confinement. Um, recently, the UN said that it's inhumane to place someone in solitary confinement, particularly adolescents, because they develop mental disorders. I've seen that happen. I've seen people to this day who, who were incarcerated for 20 or 30 years and went in when they were 16 to have mental illnesses. One individual will call me at two in the morning on a regular telling me that, you know, I was in solitary when I was inside. I'm not the same anymore. And I felt like I was in a therapist. There's not much I could have done, but I stayed on the phone with this individual for many times. Mm-hmm. But that person ended up committing another serious crime and went to prison and called me from prison jail and said, I told you so. I needed help. I went to the state to get help, but no one would help me. So no one win- wins from the way it is. But there's other countries that, that are far ahead of the U.S. that when when people commit not just youth commit crime, but when adults too commit serious crimes, there's some restorative justice that takes place between the victim's family and the individual to ensure that something like this won't happen again, Mm -hmm. to ensure that both sides has um, the services so they can not only survive, but thrive going forward. And unfortunately, we haven't gotten that, that to that place as a country. Chad. Um, so my experience with that, I would beg to differ. Um, before I became a court officer, I worked in the juvenile jails and I worked with 14 and 15 year old killers, killers. And when I looked and saw the things that these kids did and yes, it's true while they're locked up. They're behaving in a manner as a child would. But a lot of these kids, the the depraved indifference to the, 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 the depravity and the heinousness of some of the crimes that they committed and the manners in which they committed them are just like horrendous. Um, in the juvenile jail, they they go to school, um, they get rec time. They, they get three square meals. Um, they get they if if they behave themselves. A lot of a lot of juvenile jails are set up on cognitive behaviors. You behave well, you're rewarded. They're able to go and play video games. I mean, some of these kids, you know, they're enthralled with the gang life. And what I got from it, you know, I. I would sit and listen to them. Now you have kids from all kinds of gangs while they're in jail, they're friends, they're chummy. And I looked at, you know, I overheard a conversation where, cause one kid was getting ready to go home. Actually two kids were getting ready to go home. One was getting ready to go home before the other. So, you know, these kids are from, a lot of these kids are from Wilmington, Delaware, which is borderline of Philly and, and Delaware. These kids will probably be the, some of the worst kids you would ever want to meet. Some of them funny, you know, real lovable, but they just can't get that gang mentality out of their heads. But these two kids, one kid was like, yeah, I'm going home. And the other kid was like, yo, tell your boy when I see him on the street, he better duck because I'm going to be targeting him all day. And I'm sitting here, I'm listening to them. I'm like, listen, you guys are either going to change the situation, change the conversation or I'm making y'all lock in. And he was like, wow, da, da, da. I was like, that's gang, that's gang conversation. We not having that here. You're either gonna change the conversation or y'all are gonna lock in. They change the conversation. But you know, I've also talked to kids who said to me that yo, Hall, this is all I wanted to do, sell drugs and, and shoot people. And I'm looking at them like, what? What about school? What about this? Like, nah, that's not what I want to do. You know, um, I feel like the juvenile jail doesn't prepare them for what they're going to encounter when they get to adult jail. Because when they get to adult jail, 
it's a whole different story. But I'm talking about 13, 14, 15 year old kids. You know, I seen a 12 year old kid come into court with an ankle monitor. You know, uh, some kids, some older kids mm -hmm. went and bought drugs from this address. Police went and got a warrant, found a 14 year old and a 12 year old in a room where they found a handgun. Now, of course, you know, they took fingerprints and found out that the gun belongs mm -hmm. to the 12 year old, but this kid was already on the rails. He's wearing an ankle bracelet. He's being he's being monitored, but yet he's walking. You know, he has access to a thirty eight. You know, some of these kids are just they're caught up in the gang life and they see nothing else. So right there. The so right there. What what are you suggesting as somebody who's been um who grew up in a community where you grew up with LL Cool J and uh, but Damon John, who were able to lift out of this space. And then you also go into a space where these kids are in juvenile facilities. What needs to happen? What do we need to be working on to put, um, so, to, to shift so, that, to change that? So the kids that are in prison and some of the kids that I dealt with in high school as a high school dean, mm -hmm. the to me, the kids in high school were a little bit easier to, to deal with because they haven't, they hadn't yet face that reality of being, you know, incarcerated. So it was a little bit easier to reach them. And then they're looking at me with a level of respect because I come from the same streets and, you know, the hood, quote unquote, as, as they might have grown up in. So I understand the complexities of trying to navigate through situations and scenarios. Mm -hmm. But for example, I have, I, I had a kid who was locked up while I was, while I was, um, working in juvenile jail. I just saw him a couple of months ago. He came into court to pay a ticket. And, you know, I asked him, you, you doing what you're supposed to do? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. He got locked up uh, three days before Halloween, him and his brother, gang stuff. You know, just can't, just can't say no. They just, I realistically, I, I don't know what you can do for that. Okay. Because the, the cycle, the cycle okay. just keeps perpetuating. You talk, they don't listen. I, I, I see a lot of the, the teenagers, a lot of the young juveniles in jail. Some of them don't belong there. Um, I, I met a kid who just was in the wrong place, wrong time, mm -hmm. and it was hard. Okay, so I, I think a lot of what you're saying goes. We need significant system shifts if we're going to be rehabilitative in nature, if, if what we're going to do is shift behavior, keep keeping young people out of prison, if we're going to keep people from causing harm, there needs to be a significant shift in how we are addressing. So thank you so much for that. I, I, I Just because we're coming towards the end and we wanted to, I wanted to bring to Shanti on McCoy, who's going to talk a little bit about resources available to people, and I know that um, other individuals want to give some information about what resources are available. So welcome to Shanti McCoy. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming me here. Before I go on, I just want to um, just hold space for your brother, Chad, mm -hmm. and just for you, for your bravery. Um, I'm a, I'm a, I call myself a sister with an angel. I lost my brother to a homicide, um, and so I understand um, and I just want to hold space and recognize, uh, you know, just what that journey and that pathway is like. And then the same thing as well for Lawrence as well, um, the bravery and the courage of being present and sharing your story. Um, if we had time and I, cause I'm, I sit on both sides, you know, my brother's only son, um, is incarcerated right now for a homicide. And so the uniqueness of just my journey and my story um, and being able to hold space. Um, it was very um, emotional watching um, the movie and then also um, hearing both perspectives and hearing you all speak. So I just want to honor both of you, mm -hmm. uh, brothers, for your bravery um, and your courage, because it takes courage and bravery to do what we do. Um, so I'm Tashante McCoy. I am just a proud um, a member of uh, Alliance for Safety and Justice with emphasis on the Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice uh, membership engagement team. Um, what led me to this work is, again, I lost my brother to um, a homicide and I also have been shot myself at the age of 15 years old. 
Um, I lost my brother 10 years ago. And so I began organizing in my community in California, uh, just survivors, uh, but having the same type of dialogue. And then I attended a conference, um, which is um, a big part of what we do at Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice. We host um, a Survivor Speak conference. And so when I attended, it just changed my life forever. <laughs> I started out as a member, then um, a chapter coordinator for Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice, and then um, I became a part of staff. And my role is to um, engage uh, members. And it's so much um, to unpack here when we talk about services, literally listen to Chad share his journey um, as a survivor. And then um, as a person who works alongside troubled youth, there are so many um, folks that we encounter because we organize survivors. Um, what I tell folks what we do, I use four words. We build, develop, win, and heal. And so our goal is to build um, constituency among survivors and folks who've been directly impacted um, by mass incarceration as well. Um, and then we develop champions such as Chad and Lawrence and our community um, who could bring voice um, to some of the issues from both ends. Because honestly, if you look deep into it, as we saw here, um, there's a direct correlation between folks um, who are incarcerated for committing crimes and then the survivors, right? And then um, we also, um, when, you know, campaigns, we establish uh, campaigns and policies and laws that speak directly to the needs of folks who've been directed, directly impacted by um, crime and mass incarceration. And it's a pretty interesting place to be because we have our survivor um, um, leg of work, but then we also have time done, which is specific to folks who um, have been incarcerated. And then lastly, it's heal. We heal through action. And so in organizing survivors for policy change, folks assume that we're, we provide a service, like that we're service providers, um, but we're not. We're actually um, rolling out a new program. My dear sister, Trisha, who, Trisha Forbes, who is tuned in with us. Um, um, there's a team of us who are developing um, a resource uh, funnel so that we can funnel our survivors into those services. Um, speaking from the perspective of my nonprofit in my community and the importance of creating safe spaces um, and also resources for folks, I mean, those that are closest to violence, closest mm -hmm. to these issues are the very ones who can speak directly into what the need is. Um, and so it's a very important um, part of what we do, really advocating for states to um, create line items in their budgets to provide services for trauma recovery centers um, and to um, create laws. When I was thinking, Catherine, also as well, I can only imagine what that was like, right? But you know, you know, you can speak to it, what it is that you needed um, throughout that season of what you were going through, or I like to say grown through. And so we have um, in California specifically cre um, created a law where um, youth cannot be charged as adults because a lot of what uh, Lawrence um, shared um, is true about the development of the brain and just, mm -hmm. you know, children like what a child's mind is like at that time and so that's just a little bit of some of the things that we do and just the importance of making sure that those resources are available and that we're using our voices and our stories um to influence leaders and impact policy that directly affects us thank you so much Desante, for that i just want everyone to know um all of that information is in the um chat so thank you for sharing um i I want to, before I get to that last question, that um, I want to thank the Odyssey Impact team for the incredible work they did to make this event happen. Uh, I, I really want to thank the FA, everyone on the team, and um, uh, Nancy, everyone who worked from 
the production from this is an idea to working with the filmmaker. So um, our, our comms department, thank you, everyone. I want to thank Reverend Dr. Barbara for what she did in front of this camera and behind the scenes and being so well to jump on. I'm going to ask kind of as a closing, and for those of you who can stay on a little longer, I'm going to start with the Reverend. What are, what are some, this will be the question for everyone, any closing thoughts or what outcomes you would like to see from the film? I'll start with the Reverend and then I'll go over to the filmmaker. Um, on this question? Well, I think it's, I think it's important for those that, you know, find themselves at least in incarceration. How do you, how do you continue to support people's journey? I mean, I think what was really, what's been wonderful to see in terms of Lawrence's journey has been, you know, the things that he did to better himself. And, and so that should be everybody's journey while they're incarcerated is how can you how can you do the things that help you to take continue to grow and better yourself and so that um that because I think it also helps in terms of as our communities to um to be supportive of second and third chances. I mean we all make mistakes, you know, but I think that you know we wanna we wanna you know continue to support people's ability while incarcerated to, you know, to, to, to get on that journey, you know, and I think to be able to make sure that we continue to hear the voices mm -hmm. of Chad and other, you know, families that are directly impacted by this and to be able to hold those, you know, it's not, an, it's just not easy. You know, this is not, there aren't easy answers for this. Um, and to acknowledge that from the start versus kind of creating it as, as binaries, but acknowledging both of these realities are real and they are true. Thank you, Andrew. Conversation here today is, is certainly a model that I feel like I'm going to carry with me in terms of um, just it's, I think it's all in the details of people's experiences. Like we can't just rest on our own ideas. Like, I feel like what you brought Chad today, just in terms of, you know, the specifics of what it's like on in, in this, when this is your life or this is your job and the things that you see and, 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 and for all the others, you know, everyone, everyone brought just specifics. I feel like this, this sort of open table of, of bringing our you know, somewhat dissonant experiences together, knowing that it's not working over here, it's not working over there. But, but I think that um, it's just dialogue. I think is is really the like the only thing that I feel like is an obvious, an obvious thing that we need more of culturally um, to be able to bring a better path, a better way. Mm -hmm. I'd like to end uh, with comments from Lawrence and Chad, and, and just thank you from, for offering different stances on the questions and the issues that we've gone through. That is how we grow. That is how we learn. So I really feel full. I feel like I've been enlightened by both of your positions. And, and thank you for coming on to talk about this with us. Um, if either one of you wants to go. First, or do I have to uh, use my professorship and call on I, somebody? I can go first. Um, I think that you know I, I like the way you know I like the way this was this was done. I think that more more films need to be made and impact campaigns, particularly mm -hmm. um, films that dovetail or connect to this one. Maybe yes. how how economic uh, or the lack of resources impact crime. And, mm -hmm. and have these films made and marketed in a way to people in communities where the crime rate is high. So then we can stop some of these things from happening before they do happen. Mm -hmm. you know, if people can see the connection to see where it is, um, it, they'll begin to change the way they, are, they, the way they do things, mm -hmm. but also they have to be covered with resources in order to thrive themselves. And I think that many times those are the problems with some of what what caused young people to act out and gravitate towards uh, um, uh, uh, negative behaviors because that's what they see, that's what they're they're enveloped with in their communities, mm -hmm. and, and
and they soon they grow out of that as they get older. But once they make a mistake, there's no turning back. You know, they're branded with that for the rest of their lives. But mm -hmm. films can sometimes offset that. And Catherine, I won't forget you if you have closing thoughts after um, Chad speaks. Go ahead, Chad. <laughs> I know it's me. I want to thank uh, Andrew for putting this film together. Um, it 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 kind of it's 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 an ideal situation. Um, it it allows people to connect. Oh, that's this person. That's that person. That's what happened, and it 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 starts a conversation. Um, you know, I know some people might find it odd that I'm sitting here having dialogue with somebody who's responsible for my brother not being here. But when you reach a certain age in your life and maturity, and you're, as they say, you know, the brain develops fully, you're able to separate yourself from, you know, impulse choices and really think out things on an adult level and understand that mm -hmm. a lot of things that you thought were, oh, well, that's important, that's important, aren't really important. Um, and I feel that, like Lauren said, there need to be resources. This, this story of my life, Lawrence's life, his family, my family, my brother, it, it's, it's traumatizing, but when dealt with in a, in a proper manner, there are lessons to be learned from it. You know, at the end of the day, my brother, I lost my brother, he's not here. Lawrence lost 28 years of his life that he can never get back. So like I said in the film, there are no winners and no, you know, there's, there's definitely no winners here. Everybody is suffering or has suffered a loss. And like I told Lawrence yesterday during our private conversation, we can't really dwell on the past. The only thing that we can do is move forward and have conversations. You know, conversations open the doors for opportunity and change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I just want to thank you again. I feel um, that you being willing to do this, you are teaching us about bravery, about courage, about when you say adult, it's adult to change your mind. You know, it, that's that's for big folks. It's, it's, it's adult to say, I'm going to talk about this through the pain. And again, the generosity of how this will be available for people who don't have the opportunity to have this conversation. Catherine. Thank you so much, Mr. Pratt. Um, I will say emotionally, I am a wreck right now. Okay. <laughs> what, I, what I would love people to take from this is that these very honest, transparent conversations are so necessary for true change to happen. Mm -hmm. As somebody who's committed harm, it takes a lot of maturity listen to Chad and his pain mm -hmm. and understand that someone felt that because of my actions but also to look at Lawrence and see him standing there as proof mm -hmm. and myself proof that change is possible that that, that second chances <laughs> when given can be used to bring good and mm -hmm. so to put those together you have to be able to be willing to listen and no matter how much it hurts, because that's how the healing can start. The scab has to be ripped off and then the healing can start. So mm -hmm. these conversations need to happen and, and given the space to happen in a safe, secure, judgment-free space. And then that's when understanding can happen, when both sides can be heard. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I would like people to take from this. It takes courage and it takes bravery. So anybody who wants to host a screening, that's that's it. Be bold. Absolutely. I want to thank the participants. I, I didn't even have to tell you that I like folks to oh, need you to be engaged because you guys were on fire. Thank you for um, the love that you showed in the chat. Please tell people about this. Uh, thank you again for uh, letting me uh, sit in and be a part of this. If you want to get in touch with the panelists, you can find them on social media. Um, you can find them, you can find Chad on America, uh, what is it? New York Undercover season two. 
<laughs> who has an appearance there, you can find Lauren. Is this season two, Chad? Is it season two? Yeah. It was it was so long ago. I, I don't even remember. It's season two. It's the it's the Pitbull episode. You can find Lawrence at the Marshall Project and um some new things that he has coming up. Please stay engaged. You can find Andrew. Andrew, are you knee deep in your next project? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Trying to. Uh, yes, there are there are projects. This this world needs a lot of light. So Excellent. just trying to keep keep my flashlight batteries charged. Excellent. Please reach out to Catherine. There's been a lot of inquiry here. Um, you can reach us. You can reach me on social media as well. Reach out to us on Odyssey Impact and continue. Thank you for being concerned about social change. Continue to help us correct the wrongs uh, before folks even get to the justice system. Thank you so much, everyone. And I want to thank you again for your attendance and participating.